So thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, likely I was in Toronto before, uh, just before I was in last fall. So at least I can say, uh, at least I saw Toronto, <laughs> this online meeting, thanks to Robert. And um, so I'm gonna talk about this regularity for the free boundary for the two-phase Bernoulli problem, which is a joint work with uh, Lukas Polaor and Bojder Velichkov. But uh, since we are here to celebrate Alessio, I just want to give him to, to remember a bit my story with Alessio, so my collaboration with him, which was great collaboration along years. So we met for the first time, I think, in Ischia 2010. So I just realized it's 10 years ago when we were both younger. So I haven't found any picture with Ischia 2020. So this is just the announcement which is done on this uh, preprint server of Scuola Normale of the school. So it was my first year of PhD. Alessio was already professor in Austin, I think, at that moment. So he was not in the list of the speakers. He would have been the list of speakers uh, for the meeting the, the year after. But this was the first time I saw him. I don't know if we discussed at the time, but then uh, it happened that thanks to Luigi Ambrosio, which was my advisor and was also the advisor of, uh, of Alessio. So uh, we organized, uh, so I spent some time in Austin in 2011. So it was the winter of 2011. So this is the only picture I found at that time. So this is a, it's a barbecue barbecue nearby Austin so in uh, 2011 and then is there where we really started working together and then I would like to have this picture of Oberwolf of 2011 because it was during this meeting that I wrote the first paper with Alessio at least we had the first result together about Monjan Per equation so you probably I mean I haven't been so able to to find both of us in this picture so at least I, I think I'm here somewhere Alessio I'm not sure. Maybe we'll skip, skip the picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but since then we started working together and we, well, we became friends in those years and then we also collaborators. So we have been working hard a lot together. So I, mostly me learning from him. So just mathematics, but not only, as you can see here, yeah, learning how to play Pac-Man. <laughs> and uh, this has kept going for years till today, and this is the last picture I want to, to show because I really like this picture. So this picture was taken in Rio just after Alessio was awarded of the Fitz Medal. And uh, so you see, it's uh, pretty happy. Uh, but I, I like this picture because it's with my, both my official advisors, which are Luigi Ambrosio and Luis Caffarelli, and with my unofficial advisor, because I really owe most of the mathematics I know I really owe it to Alessio. So that's a, that's a picture I really like. So after this memories, we can move to the actual mathematical part of the talk. So I want to discuss the Bernoulli free boundary problem or the, the two phase Bernoulli free boundary problem. So let, let me introduce what, what is the problem first, and then I'll motivate a bit why I want to study it. So we we'll start with three non-negative numbers, lambda zero, lambda plus, and lambda minus, and I'm going to define the following function. So I take a function u, I'm considering the Dirichlet energy of u, so the integral of gradient u square, and then I add to the Dirichlet energy the measure of the positive, negative, and zero phase of u weighted accordingly to these three coefficients, so lambda plus, lambda minus, and lambda zero. And then I'm going to consider this minimization problem. So I'm looking for a function u, which minimizes this energy with some prescribed boundary data. OK, so you would immediately notice that actually there is no, ne no need to put all the three phases in the functional, because the sum of the three, three measure is the measure of the domain d, which we're going to assume to be bounded. So <clears throat> actually, you, you can remove one of the three, just uh, sort of. By, by imposing, I mean, it's, uh, that, since you know the sum, but I, I like to, to put the three of them because th this function is known as a two-phase Bernoulli functional, but uh, I would uh, try to argue during the talk that this is actually a three-phase problem. 
So I think if I write the function in this way, it's more clear that there are three phases you want to take into account. So the positive, the negative, and the zero, and that the, their interaction is what we really would like to, to understand, okay? So, so that's why I like this function and written in this way better. Okay, so this is the minimization problem we, we want to, to study. So there are a few basic steps when you want to study a minimization problem. So the you have to deal with. So the first step is just existence, which is pretty easy. It's just an easy exercise in the direct method of calculus variation. The problem is pretty much non-convex because of this term here. Yeah. And uh, indeed, you don't have uniqueness. So in general, uniqueness fades or minimizers, unless you have peculiar situations. And the general principle is that the minimizer would like to be harmonic somehow to make this term happy. But these other terms are somehow preventing the minimizer to be harmonic, because we know that, for instance, say that uh, we will see a particular instance in which you just remove these two terms. So you see now, and say you minimize among positive functions, so a positive, so a non-negative harmonic function is strictly positive, right? But so this term would be huge. So there might be a tentative of balance between these two terms in which the function, okay, want to be harmonic, but maybe sometimes you also want to be zero, okay? Or so depending on what is the weight of these coefficients, the function might try to arrange the measure of its positive, negative, or zero phase in a way to make this term of the functional happy, but this would make unhappy the, the, the Dirichlet energy, okay? So the, the problem is non-trivial, like, I mean, it's, there is a competition between the, the terms. So that's the, the, the situation I was mentioning before. There is a peculiar situation, a peculiar uh, case of this minimization problem, which is when you have no weights on the positive and negative phase. So, uh, sorry, on the zero and negative phase. So these are weighted with zero and your boundary data is positive. So in this case, there is no reason for the minimizer to be negative. So you, the, the minimization problem can be is the same that minimizing among non-negative functions and you're minimizing this energy. And this goes uh, under the name of a one phase Bernoulli problem. And I'm gonna recall a few things also on this problem uh, later on. And it's called one phase because actually you just have the positive phase though, as I was saying, it's, so there, are, there is also the zero phase, okay? So, but these are the name which has been uh, these which are by now classical in literature, so I'm not trying to change them. Okay, so this problem was introduced in the 80s by Altkapfer, at least to the best of my knowledge. Well, maybe slightly before, but was really deeply studied in the 80s by Altkapferelli for the, the one-phase problem and Altkapferelli and Friedman for the two-phase problem. And their motivation was some problems in on the behavior of flows with jets and cavities. But actually the, this type of problem are, have become since then sort of model problems in free boundary. Okay, so essentially, maybe this is a bit too strong statement, but I would say there are two main model problems in free boundaries. One is the obstacle problem, which we saw in the other talks. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend all the talks because I was teaching, but uh, I think that uh, Xavi and Joachim discussed this uh, yesterday about the, the, the obstacle problem. This is a different somehow type of free boundary problem, but I, I would argue that it's a, as fundamental as the obstacle problem. So, okay, so these are two different type of free boundary problems and they are sort of model problems for several other problems. So actually I, I became interested in this type of problem because of the fact that this problem has some applications in shape optimization problems. So shape optimization problems are type, uh, certain type of problem I'm gonna describe in which I was interested during my PhD and I kept this interest along years and they naturally lead to the study of this uh, one or two phase problems. And maybe I want to describe this link a bit I want to describe this link a bit so to, to see what are possible applications of what I'm going to do. 
So the first type of shape optimization problem I, I want to consider is this um, optimal capacitary problem. So what happens here is that we have a domain D and then we take a subdomain U of D and we consider the Newtonian capacity of U relative to D, which is nothing but this minimum value, the, the minimum value of this problem. So you try to you look to the optimal transition somehow from one to zero. So you have a function which is one on U and zero on the boundary of D and you want this function to be harmonic in between, okay? So that's actually the, the, the capacity of a capacitor with the shape of U. So you would like to, to optimize this capacity. Now it's easy to see that if you just optimize the capacity, the optimal value will be zero. So the, the best would be to take U basically empty. So, <clears throat> so in, in order to have a problem which is non-trivial, you have to impose some, some constraint on U. So a very natural one is a measure constraints or you penalize somehow the measure of you to be too small in this way, okay? So that's somehow the, the, the Euler-Lagrange version of the volume constraint. It's not always, the, the two problems are not always equivalent, but for the sake of simplicity, let me, let me consider this one. And now you realize that this is a mean-mean problem, right? Because it's a minimum for the capacity and then the capacity is a minimum itself. So you can rewrite just as a single minimum problem of this form. So you're now minimizing a Mongol function V, which are zero on the boundary of D, and you have the Indirichle energy, and then U is replaced with the, with the set where V is equal to one, okay? And now you realize that for this minimum problem, that for your optimal function, there is no reason to be larger than one, neither, neither larger than one nor negative. So it's the same and and that the, the measure where V is not one is the measure where V is in between uh, zero, zero and one. So you can, it's just an algebraic replacement. So you're actually minimizing this functional here. So the integral of DV uh, gradient V square plus the measure where V is in between uh, zero and one. And then you have a term which is, does, which is just a constant. So you don't care in the minimization problem. And now if you call u one minus v, you see that u is solving a one phase Bernoulli problem, okay? So understanding what is the behavior of the one phase Bernoulli problem allows you to say what is the shape or the regularity of this optimal capacitor, okay? So you see that that's the first link between one phase Bernoulli problem and the shape optimization problem. Uh, a second type of shape optimization problem, which will lead us to the two-phase Bernoulli problem is instead the following. So this time you start with a domain D again, and you fix a number N and you look to an n-tuple of this joint subset of D. And now among all n-tuples of this joint subset of D, you try to optimize this energy. So you take into account the first Dirichlet and value of, uh, of the i, and then you weight somehow the measure of the i, okay? And now, and you look what is the optimal n-tuple for this problem, okay? So be careful, I'm not saying that this is gonna be a partition, and indeed it's not going to be a partition. So I just take an n-tuple and then try to optimize this, this energy. Here, the, the first eigenvalue, the, the just that is the, the infimum of these uh, Rayleigh equations, okay? so. How minimizer of this problem looks like? Well, if you run some numerical simulation, you see that that's basically what you what you're gonna get. So these domains, they uh, first of all they, they do not form a, they do not form a partition. So here there is some empty space. They uh, seems to touch at most two by two. So there are no triple or higher uh, multiplicity points. And, uh, and this actually, you, you can actually prove. And what is the link between this, this type of uh, problem and the um, two-phase Bernoulli problem? Well, if you take UI, so you fix an, two indexes, i and j, and you take ui and uj as the, fir the um, first eigenfunction of the domains, the i and dj, so those which are the minimizer of this, uh, uh, this of this uh, Rayleigh quotient, 
Well, then you can easily prove that the difference between these two eigenfunctions is basically a solution of a Bernoulli two-phase problem in which you are weighting zero, the, the, the zero phase. So the, the weight in front of the zero phase is zero. And then, okay, you have some higher order terms because it's not that the eigenvalue is really minimizing the Dirichlet energy, but the other terms is like related to you, to you. So it's sort of higher order in this, uh, in this situation. But uh, okay, beside this higher order term, you are really minimizing a um, Bernoulli two-phase problem. So if you want to understand what is the shape or what is the possible regularity of this, uh, this um, optimizer here, what you really want to, 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 to study is the two-phase Bernoulli problem, okay? And so that's what, and in particular, I mean, you're really interested in what is the free boundary of this Bernoulli problem, because as we were saying, coming from shape optimization, I don't really care too much about the function. I'm, most, I'm mostly caring about what is the shape and the, the behavior of the positive and negative phase, okay? So what is the thing we are going to study? So you can define gamma plus to be somehow the positive free boundary. So the boundary of the, the positive region, gamma minus to be the, the boundary of the negative region and gamma to be just a union. So the actual full free boundary. And what the numerical simulation are suggesting is that the picture you're going to see is something like this. So you might have some zero phase you have the positive and negative phase and the free boundary looks like reasonably smooth and they should touch somehow tangentially, okay? So that's what you would like to, to, to be able to, to, to show somehow, okay? So <clears throat> what is known about these problems? So the first thing is that you can prove what is the optimal regularity for you. So you is Lipschitz. So in the one phase problem, this is, not too hard to show. I mean, okay. Let's say it's easier and was proved by Alton Gaffarelli. And uh, for the two-phase case, it's again true. And this was proved by Alton Gaffarelli and Friedman. Okay. So Lipschitz regularity, we will see it somehow optimal. And it's extremely important because it's the regularity which makes the, the two terms of the function. Also remember the function is something like this. Lambda plus measure where u is positive, lambda minus measure where u is negative, let's say lambda zero measure where u is equal to zero. So uh, it's the terms, it's the regularity which makes all the terms of the functional scales in the same way. So if you just uh, look to the unit of measure of this, uh, of this functional, you see that now each term scales like a, like a measure actually, because being u Lipschitz, you should behave like a radius, like a distance. So uh, the gradient of u is like of, of order zero. So it has no unit. So this is the, the key step in, in all these proofs. And then uh, the regularity for the one phase problem was established by Alt Caffarelli, basically in this paper in the 80s, but then was refined by Weiss, by Jerison and Savin. And there is a decent new proof of Daniela of this result, which for us was really inspiring actually. So that's why I'm mentioning. And uh, so the result tells you that the free boundary, so that now there is just a positive free boundary is actually smooth, except possible for a small set of singularity. So this set of singularity is closed because it's a singular set I mean, it's basically closed by definition and has a small Hausdorff dimension. So the Hausdorff dimension is at most d minus five. And uh, actually this singular set has to be there because there is an example of Daniela and Jerison in which it's shown that you can build up a minimizer with the point singularity in dimension seven. So the, the thing which you might want to notice here is that actually there is a gap. So we know that there are no singularity that so the, the first dimension in which point singularity can appear is five but the first example is seven. So we don't know actually what happens in, in between. So we don't know if we can make this example working in lower dimension or if we can improve this bound to D minus seven, basically. Okay, so that's, but that's the only open thing on the one phase boundary problem, on the one phase Bernoulli problem, essentially. 
So what for the two-phase free boundary problem? Well, in this case, there is a peculiar situation in which the weight on the negative, uh, on the zero phase, so lambda zero, is larger or equal than the minimum between the positive and negative weight. So in this case, what you can show, I'll show you in the next slide, is that actually the positive and negative free boundary, they coincide. So there is no zero phase, or at least there is no zero phase with positive measure, and that this free boundary is smooth. So basically the point is to show that, and that's quite easy, I'll show you in the next slide, that the, the, in this, under this assumption that the, the positive and negative free boundary, they coincide. And then you can apply some extremely nice result of Caffarelli, which were done in the 80s, to show that then it is smooth. And again, this result has been reviewed recently by Daniela De Silva, Fausto Ferrari, Sandro Salsa, by following this ideas of, of Daniela. And they gave a new proof of this result of Caffarelli of the, of the 80s. But to apply both this type of result to this problem, you really need this uh, free boundaries to coincide. And why do they coincide in this, in this situation? Well, that's a very simple computation. So assume, for instance, that lambda minus is less or equal than lambda zero. OK, so then the weight on the negative phase is less or equal than the weight of the, on the zero phase. So now you're going to you take a, any possible competitor and you're going to construct a better one in this way. So you take the negative, so you take the negative and the zero phase here. And what you're going to do is to consider the harmonic extension inside this region of uh, so you, you're going to take a function uh, let's call it v which is equal to u minus on this boundary and which is harmonic inside the set. Okay, so V is this my function. And now uh, you build a new competitor which has the same positive phase of U and you replace the negative phase by V. Okay, so the negative phase is positive in this convention. Okay, so U minus is positive, so you don't minus V. And now it's easy to see that this new competitor has less energy. Why that? Well, the, the Dirichlet energy of the positive part is the same, and on the negative part, since V is harmonic, is going to be less. On the other hand, the measure where W is negative is this region here, which is the sum of the measure where U was negative and where U was zero. But now, by the way you choose the, by the way the, the coefficients are, so lambda zero is larger than lambda minus, you see that this term of the function are also decrease, just without any deep uh, consideration. So this, this competitor is definitely better than the, the one you started with. So there is no reason for the minimizer to have any zero phase, okay? So that's very simple. So basically you just have, here you really have just two phases, the positive and the negative one. And you want to investigate the regularity of the free boundary. So over the two phases changes, and that's not easy, but was done by, um, by Caffarelli in the 80s. Okay, but actually, if you think to, to the problem I was mentioning before, so like the optimal, this optimal uh, subdivision problem, uh, you see that there isn't zero phase. So you are not in, so you are in this assumption. So the phase on the weight on the zero phase, which is actually zero, uh, in, the, in that case, what zero is surely less than the, ma the minimum between lambda plus and lambda minus. Well, then in this situation, you might have a zero phase, and now you're focused in understanding what happens where the, at those points where all the three phases coexist. Okay, so I'm going to call these branch points, and you would like to understand what is the behavior around these branch points because. Basically, if you are far from a branch point, you are either in a situation in which you locally see a one phase problem or in a situation where you locally see a two phase problem. So the, the real issue is to understand what is happening around these branch points. Well, this is the first issue. And the second issue is actually to, to somehow um, make a link among all uh, these possible regularity theories, okay? So you have a different type of regularity theory. You have two phase, a two phase point and the one phase points and you want all this regularity theory to go through branch points and to be somehow uniform. And that's actually <clears throat> what we have been able to, to prove with um, Luca and Bojidar. 
So the theorem is the following. So you take a, a local minimizer of your energy. Again, remember, I'm going to define gamma plus and gamma minus as the boundary of the positive and negative phase. Then I'm going to introduce what is the two phase pre boundary, which is just the intersection of these two sets, which you see it's just a closed set. And then I'm going to define the positive and negative one phase free boundary, so which is actually relatively open and uh, is really where, where your problem looks like a, a one phase and two phase a one phase problem. So our main result is that both gamma plus and gamma minus are smooth manifolds, well smooth, they are C1 alpha manifolds outside a relative closed sets, which is possibly small, or which is small. And actually this closed set is far from the two phase free boundary. So it's also far from the branch point. So actually this singular set is just due to the one phase free boundary. Okay, so it's the singular set which was appearing in the result I was mentioning about, uh, about uh, one phase problem. So around two phase points, there is no singular set. Okay, so singular set just it's just a one phase phenomena. And so here I'm stating this as the fact that the singular set does not intersect the, the two phase pre boundary, but since these are both closed set, actually they are positive distance one from the other. Okay. So so really the, the picture, so the result of this theorem is that the, the picture is really what you expect. So you have these two C1 alpha graphs which touch tangentially along this two phase set. Okay, so the behavior around the branch point is to the fact that so branch points are just contained in the intersection of two uh, C1 alpha graphs. So at the moment, we don't know that they are any better than this, but there is some hope that we're going to show it. But the, the results, so up to now, the result is not telling you anything about this closed set. Okay, so for, for uh, as much as we know, this closed set can be any basically subset of any closed subset of a C1 alpha graph. So maybe I want to stress here. So usually we, you don't want to enter in technicality, say ah, C1 alpha, whatever. So we would just say, okay, but, and the typical step is once you are C1 alpha, you are smooth for, for those who knows regularity theory, but here it's really, so we proved C1 alpha and uh, uh, this regularity should be optimal. So actually not the alpha we found in the paper, but uh, would, this is gonna be clear later on. Uh, I would expect the optimal regularity here to be C11 alpha, okay? So that's why I'm not saying ah, these are two smooth graph, smooth graph, or maybe I'm gonna say that they are uh, two smooth graph, but by smooth, it just means C1, C1 alpha, okay? <laughs> so that's, that's the, best, uh, the best regularity you should expect here. Um, okay, so this is our uh, our main result, and how how do we prove a result like that? So I would say so. I mostly come from geometric measure theory, so the, this type of result, they, so the, the, the lot of techniques in free boundary were borrowed by techniques first developed in geometric measure theory. Well, okay, there was an interaction between the two fields. Let's say so. That's a nice interaction. So the techniques move from one field to the next one. And the proof is basically based on two steps. One, the first of which is like a, a sort of blow up analysis. And the second one is an epsilon regularity theory. Okay. So, so people expert in regularity would already probably understood how the proof should work, but I will nevertheless go through some step. And, and explain what are the difficulties in these two steps. In what well, mostly the, the most difficult part is actually this epsilon regularity theorem. But before that, I would like to, to, so you start with a variational problem. And the first thing you want to do when you start with the variational problem is to understand what are the optimality condition of this variational problem, okay? These are usually what should give you, help you at least to, to gain some regularity. Okay, so the first, Optimality condition is pretty simple. So our functions are continuous. So the optimizer is continuous. So it has to be harmonic when it is non-zero. Okay, that's just because if you make a small perturbation around the, where the, uh, in a point where the function is say positive, if the, if the perturbation is small enough, then you're not going to change 
the measure where the function is positive, negative, or zero. So you just want the Dirichlet energy part to be happy, so you have to be harmonic. Okay, that's pretty much trivial. And it's telling you nothing about the free boundary because in this type of perturbation, you are not moving the free boundary. So you cannot gain any information on the free boundary. So what are the optimality condition of the free boundary? Well, to, to understand what are the optimality condition of the free boundary, you have to move the free boundary. And this is usually done through what are called inner variations. So what is an inner variation? Well, instead, so the, the typical variation you do in this setting here is to take u and to substitute to u, u plus epsilon phi, where phi is some smooth function. So you're just perturbing the graph of u somehow towards in the vertical direction. Here, what you do is that you start from your domain, you take a point x and you move this point x along a given vector field by some tiny step uh, epsilon. And so basically you are renaming the points of the graphs of u. And now this u epsilon is a function with that epsilon equal zero coincide with u and that's an admissible competitor. So if you compute the energy of this u epsilon, this has to be minimum at when epsilon is equal to zero. And so the derivative somehow has to be zero. Okay, so that's how you build up an inner variation. But let me give you, so I'm not going to do this computation, but I'm gonna do a similar one, actually. Uh, starting when u is one dimensional, which is a pretty relevant case, as we will see. So u is one dimensional, it has to be harmonic where it is non-zero. So basically it's given by two, it's a piecewise linear function. So you have um, positive part is a, linear function with the slope alpha, negative part is a linear function with the slope beta. And you want to understand what is the relation between alpha and beta. And what you do now is just you move a bit the free boundaries. So you move say on the right by epsilon, by a tiny epsilon. Now you build a new competitor, which is again piecewise linear, which formula I hope is this one. Um, and you compute what is the energy of this u epsilon and the difference with u. And now if you do the computations, what you get is that, so you want the first order in epsilon to be non-negative. Actually, so, but you see, well, you want it to be zero actually, because you can take both positive epsilon or negative epsilon, right? So th this, this perturbation can be done in both ways. And now you see here that the optimality condition you get is that essentially is a transmission type condition where the difference between the two slopes, actually between the square of the slopes, is equal to the difference between the weights of the positive and negative function, of the positive and negative part. You can do the same type of argument when you are in a one phase point, right? Because in that case, you expect your function to be something like this, and you can try to move this point on the right or on the left. So you get either this or the fact that alpha square should be equal to lambda plus at one phase point. So on, so this would be gamma plus one phase. And uh, yes, and beta square should be equal to lambda minus, uh, lambda plus minus lambda zero, sorry. And this lambda minus minus lambda zero, this is on the negative one phase points. Um, so this is what's happening at this, uh, at this points, but there is another type of perturbation you can do, which actually is not really a diffeomorphism, okay? So, what is this perturbation? Well, you might somehow break the positive and the negative part. So what you're gonna do here is just you keep the negative part still and you just move tiny on the right, the positive part, okay? So now your competitor looks like this. And if you compute the differences, you get that this term here has to be non-negative. But now you see that this time epsilon has to be positive, right? You cannot do this perturbation on the left because your function is not going to be a function anymore. So this means that this time you don't get an equality, but you just get an inequality, which is that the slope of the positive phase is larger or equal than lambda plus minus lambda zero. Okay? And same thing for the negative phase. So if you summarize all of that, you get at least formally that your uh, optimizer should satisfy this Euler-Lagrange equation. So it's harmonic where it is non-zero. 
it is solving some transmission type condition, both on the positive uh, one phase part and on the two phase part. And it has a global inequality on the gradient, which is, you see, we will see that it's the, the key, the key, the key inequalities here, okay? So th these are at least formally the, the optimality condition you should expect for, for your problem. Uh, so once you have optimality condition, you can start performing this um, uh, blow, up, uh, blow up analysis. So you would like to understand what is the asymptotic behavior of the free boundary around the free boundary point. So you do the following. So you take say a free boundary point here somewhere and you're going to zoom around it. So meaning that you take a small ball centered around this free boundary point, and you're going to make this small ball a ball, oops, a ball, okay. <laughs> something which looks like a ball of radius one. OK, so this would be like one, which so this is what you would like to do. So what you're actually doing, what you're doing is just you're scaling your functions. So around these points, okay? So, and you're performing this Lipschitz scaling because that's what I was saying is the natural scaling of the functional, which is taking all the term, to, which is making all the term of the functional scales the same. Now, since you, x zero was a free boundary point, u in x zero is, uh, is zero. So it's like uh, the same that's subtracting here. And now you can uh, exploit Lipschitz regularity to see that this family of functional is pre-compact in the, C0 topology, so it has limit points. And now there is an important monotonicity formula, which was first discovered by Weiss, which tells you that these limit points are going to be one homogeneous, okay? Which is what you should expect in a blow up. So somehow a blow up should simplify, and indeed you get this, this one homogeneity, which is actually somehow killing one direction in the blow up, okay? So what happens if you do this blow up around a regular point? So imagine that you already knew that your free boundary was regular, somehow was like the conclusion of the theorem, which is always a good idea. You start from the conclusion and you see if you get something. Well, in this case, so if my free boundary was somehow a C1 at least, then it has a normal vector at each point. And what you would expect to see is these one dimensional functionals in the blow up. These one dimensional functions in the blow up. So you're gonna get either a, what is called a half plane solution if you're taking a blow up at a one phase point. So something which this picture should be something like this. So this is a one phase point or somehow uh, a two plane solution. Uh, at two phase points. And these functions are going to be constant in the direction which are orthogonal to this normal vector here. Okay. So that's what you would expect around the regular point. So we do the opposite, and you are going to call a point regular if it admits a blow up limit of this form. Okay. For some vector e. So that's a terribly horrible definition because you see. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, so it's very weak because I'm asking just to have a, a one blow up in this uh, of this form, and actually have no at the moment. I cannot even. There is no reason why blow up should be unique. So I might have blow up of this form for a different vector, or even I might have which would correspond somehow to a spiraling uh, situation for the free boundary, or I might have even blow up which looks like. Uh, one dimensional along a certain scale and maybe multidimensional along other scales. But even if you start with this very weak definition, the first thing you can show is that somehow the point where you see non one dimensional blow up are somehow small. So this goes under the, this is a by now well established techniques, which is called um, uh, feather, it's you basically to feather, and it's called dimension reduction. So you can show actually that the set of non regular points, even accordingly to this weak definition, are somehow small, is somehow small. Okay, so these are the set sigma plus and sigma minus I was mentioning before. 
And you can also show that these points cannot appear when you are in a two-phase free boundary, so at a point where you expect to see a blow up like this. Um, so now the, the, the actual difficult part is to show that if you are in a regular point, you are really regular, okay? So that you gave a good definition of regular point. And so you want to show, first of all, so essentially you would like to show that all blow ups are the same and that locally you are uh, somehow a smooth or better a C1 alpha graph around, around uh, two C1 alpha graphs around that point. And this is what really uh, is an epsilon regularity theorem because you want to move somehow from an infinitesimal information, which is the structure of the blow up, to a sort of size one information, which is like what is happening in a neighborhood of that point, okay? And here is where the, the things become interesting. So, and this is actually, I mean, this is a very general scheme and the epsilon regularity theory was known at one phase point. This was basically the, the work of Al Caffarelli and this new version of it due to Daniela and at point which are in the interior of the two phase free boundary. So points where you don't see the zero phase essentially in the neighborhood. So, well, we don't see the, a positive measure of the zero phase in the neighborhood and this was due to Caffarelli and then again, this new proof of the Silva Ferrari and Sachs. So the, the key step here is to understand what happens around branch points, okay? So where you have a, a zero phase, so U positive, U negative, and U zero. And you see that somehow even by the study of the blow ups, the zero phase is going to disappear in the limit. So that's, so you, you really have to understand what happens in, what is happening here, though in the limit, you don't see the zero phase. Okay, at least at the first limit. So you need somehow to compute the second limit. That's, and that's actually the, 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 the point of the proof. But let me give you a simplified version of the proof, which is essentially the, the epsilon regularity theorem at one phase point. And that's what uh, was somehow done by Daniela. So I'm gonna review her proof, which I really like, and then show at the end how to make the next step. So you are around a positive uh, a one phase point. So I'm gonna normalize everything. So the, the weight on the positive phase is one and of the zero and negative zero. And uh, I'm assuming that my direction is the E1 direction. So in the limit, I expect to see this function here, which is just the positive part of X1. Now, since the, my function U should resemble like X1, the positive part of X1, I'm gonna define this function V epsilon as the perturbation of U with respect to X1. And then this epsilon is chosen in a way such that this V epsilon has sides one, okay? So what is what are the equations satisfied by V epsilon, okay? Well, first of all, V epsilon is harmonic on the region where U is positive because these two functions are both harmonic on the region. And the region where U is positive should somehow resemble an half ball, right? Because U should resemble um, the positive part of, of X1. So you would expect U equals zero to be pretty much this positive half ball, okay? And now, okay, this is again a non, it's an important optimality condition, but it's not telling you anything about what is happening around the free boundary. So around the free boundary, you want to expand the optimality condition you have, which is this time it's just that the modulus of the gradient is one. And if you expand this optimality condition, you get that up to higher order term, the, the, so let's say du, uh, the, the, the norm, the, the, one, the, the derivative in this direction for V should be essentially zero on this free boundary, which is almost the boundary of the half. So the, the, the say the, this boundary, this part of the boundary for the half ball. So in other words, V epsilon should be pretty much close to the solution of this Neumann problem here. Okay. So now you have a well-known regularity theory for this Neumann problem. And now it's somehow what you want to do is to pull back this regularity theory for, uh, so you expect V epsilon to go in the limit somehow to, to a solution of this Neumann problem. And you would like to pull back the regularity of the Neumann problem to the regularity of the epsilon. So this idea was introduced for the first time by the Georgi in the study of minimal surfaces. And it has been, I think, one of the most productive idea in PDE somehow. Um, 
And you can actually do this. So basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna use this regularity for the Neumann problem to find the new vector E. So it's a small rotation of your original vector such that now on a smaller scale, smaller but fixed scale, U is gonna be close to an half plane solution, but now with respect to this new direction E by a, a geometric factor better than I was close to the to the starting bar. Okay. So basically you are you you keep now you can keep iterating this this procedure and you are basically constructing the normal vector to your actual free boundary. Okay. So that's uh, that's somehow the, the, the general step of the proof for uh, for those which knows regularity theory is quite intuitive now. And that's how you prove C. You see here, you're almost getting a C2 regularity of, of the free boundary. And the reason we are, so this is, so this exponent here is basically driving the, the regularity of the free boundary. And the reason we, you are, why you are very close to a C2 regularity is because the limiting problem has uh, a C2 regularity, okay? So now what is happening at branch points, which are those we are interested in? Well, again, let me normalize things such that lambda plus and lambda minus are one, lambda zero is zero. So you now should resemble a linear function x1, which for the sake of clarity, I'm writing as the positive part of x1 minus the negative part of x1. And then you have some, oops. And now you have some small perturbation, v plus and v minus of this function, okay? And what you can prove is that this, you want to look to both this perturbation, V plus and V minus, and they are gonna solve a sort of thin membrane problem. And actually this V plus and V minus, so you should think to this V plus and V minus. So if you, if you look to this formula and you look at what, happen, what is happening on say on the positive free boundary, so on gamma plus, on gamma plus, you know that U is zero, and so basically what you get out of this, uh, this perturbation is that along gamma plus, you have that X1 is basically epsilon V plus. And same thing along gamma minus. So along gamma minus, you expect X1 to be epsilon V minus, V minus, V plus or V minus of epsilon. So somehow, V plus and V minus are going to be asymptotically the graph of your free boundary. So the free boundary is somehow asymptotically uh, described by the graph of the traces of V plus and V minus on the half plane, okay? So in the limits, in the limiting problem, you should think that V plus and V minus are really some of the limiting trace, uh, the, lim the traces of V plus and V minus on the, on the diameter of the ball to represent somehow the, the, the initial description of the free bound. So the, the first somehow non-trivial term in the description of the free boundary when, when epsilon is very small, okay? And what is the, the equation satisfied by this V plus V minus, you see that you have, a, so this transmission condition here becomes a Neumann condition on the positive free boundary and the positive, oh, sorry, on the positive or negative free boundary, which is, as I was saying, that if you think to the traces of V plus and V minus somehow as, the, as a good approximation of the graph of, um, of the free boundary, you see that positive and negative free boundary corresponds to those points where V plus and V minus are not the same. So we're actually, see, you have a zero phase in between then where they are the same, so you should be on the two-phase free boundary, well, then you have a, a transmission condition, which comes from this transmission condition here. And then you have a global inequality, which comes from this inequality here. And now this problem here, uh, I call it a thin to membrane problem, because somehow it's, this is the variational problem you get if you try to minimize the Dirichlet energy between two couple of functions, one on the positive half ball, one on the negative half ball, on which you impose the fact that the traces of one should be on top of the other on the, on the diameter of the ball. Okay, so these are the optimality condition you will get. Actually, since the problem is convex, it's really the same. 
So, so now the, the point is that once you have this global inequality here, you really see that this problem has a good C1, one half regularity. Theory. This comes immediately. So you, you can reduce this two membrane problem to the thin obstacle problem quite easily. And people who work in the thin obstacle problem knows that this is like somehow the key step, to prove, one of the key steps to prove regularity because in a sense is allowing you to skip the first bad solution, which is a square root. So you start to skip the bad solution, the first bad solution, then you get the next one, which is, which has C1, one half regularity somehow. It's very fast. So the, this inequality is what ensures C1, one half regularity. And now this is what would allow you to conclude. So say it this way, it seems everything very easy, but when you do this proof, there is a key technical, well, it's not really technical because I mean, you can run this formal proof for several problems in which the regularity is false. So there is somewhere, somewhere there should be something which, uh, where the actual difficulty is. And the, 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 the point where the actual difficulty is, is the compactness of this approximate function V plus V minus epsilon, because in a sense, you want them to converge strongly enough to the limiting problem so that you can pull back the regularity theory of the limiting problem in a topology which is strong enough. And what is, and the point is that what is a good topology? Well, in this case, a good topology will be somehow the C0 topology. But if you remember my V plus and V minus, they are just bounded in the C0 topology, right? So here you see that you already have to gain some tiny regularity because you want to have a sequence of function which is bounded in the C0 topology to converge in the C0 topology. And this is false, unless you have some derivative control or sort of older control, which is the same, in order to, to gain compactness. And this is a nonlinear thing because you cannot rely on the regularity of the linear problem because you don't yet know that you're gonna be close to the limiting problem enough to gain this regularity. Okay, so this is really a key step in all these proofs. So to, to pass from a formal proof to an actual proof, you have to understand these steps. And here is where proof fades. Okay, so there are situations in which you don't have regularity and the reason is that not because the formal argument doesn't work, but because you cannot really prove compactness. And here the, the key point to prove compactness is to adapt the techniques due to Ovidiu Savin, actually when he was a PhD in Austin, a PhD student in Austin, uh, in this solution of the, the Georges conjecture, which is this sort of partial Arnak inequality and actually is a sort of partial elder regularity. So you're gonna get some elder regularity almost, which is what gives you this C0 compactness. And the key point in all this thing, so in order to prove elder regularity, you just don't have to analyze what happens around your branch point, right? Because elder regularity, I mean, should be obtained in all points nearby. So you need also to analyze around points which are in which, which when you zoom looks somehow like this. So you see now that you have the zero phase in really in between the, the positive and negative phase. So in other words, you don't just have to look what happens when you resemble a function like this, but also when you resemble a function like this, which is like positive, zero, negative. Okay, so you see that there is a sort of discontinuity between this, this function and this function here. So you really need to understand in which regime you are and move from one regime to the next. And that's what you, what you really need to do in this uh, compactness part, which will bring you to the epsilon regularity. Okay, and with this, I conclude. I congratulate Alessio for this achievement and I oops, cheers to the next one.